Well, this is Tanner Dykin, a pastor at Open Door Baptist Church. I just wanted to do a, a few little videos reviewing the a debate that I had with my cousin, Matt McDougall. Uh, the topic of the discussion was uh, justification by faith alone. And uh, it's been uh, a couple weeks. It's coming up on three weeks now, actually, since we had the debate. And uh, I, you know, I wanted to let the debate have a little bit of time to, to breathe, have a little time for people to uh, uh, watch it. Uh, understand what's being said in it before I, you know, started doing any you know, kind of review stuff. But I think now it's it's been long enough that uh, it'll it'll be all right to uh, start doing a review on it. Uh, I'll be having another debate actually uh, here next month on the 18th and 19th uh, with a another restorationist on essentially the same topic. We're doing a little different format and we'll be talking a little bit more about baptism in that debate than uh, we talked about here in this debate. Uh, but uh, I just, I, the, I really, I really wanted to, to do some examination of this debate because we had some connectivity issues, uh, both on my side and his side. And uh, so it's, it's understandable a few places where, you know, mo uh, both of us uh, seem to ignore arguments from the other. It was, it was mostly because we had trouble with connectivity. The second night wasn't uh, wasn't near as bad. It, it actually flowed a lot smoother. We could hear each other for uh, essentially everything that we said on the second night. But for the first night, especially, uh, there was a, a lot of um, there was a lot of uh, trouble. There was a lot of, of issues there. Uh, but I wanted to do a just a, a few short videos. I'll do this video today uh, on the first night of the debate. And just going over what Matt said and uh, giving a few comments on it, giving a few, you know, pointers that uh, I really think a lot of the arguments that he uses are are dangerous. That they, they they really do uh, break the flow of a lot of texts. Uh, in fact, I think that a lot of the, what he says uh, takes texts and flips them up on their head. Uh, he he takes them completely backwards. He he misses the point by uh, by a mile. And so uh, I just wanted to do this, uh, you know, and, and just to, to, you know, get across before I do this, I don't mean any ill will towards Matt. And uh, I think he knows that. And, and I know that he doesn't mean any ill will toward me. Uh, we're, we're genuinely trying to hash out these issues, genuinely, genuinely trying to get out what we believe and uh, uh, what the Bible teaches. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to do that. And uh, so I don't mean any ill will toward him. Uh, but uh, these things do need to be brought out, that, that they are uh, bad arguments that are being used by him, and uh, so we'll, uh, we'll look at those. Uh, again, uh, next month I'll be having another debate, and uh, uh, we'll see how that one goes. And so for now we'll just uh, we'll jump right on in and uh, start looking at these arguments that Matt did. Uh, this is at the beginning of the, uh, his opening statement on the first night. And uh, I, I uh, just wanted to point out that we have a, a very nice uh, profile uh, right here that looks a lot like Max Stirner, the, uh, the anarchist philosopher, the, the, the sketch of Max Stirner that you can find uh, on the internet. It's, I just thought it was kind of funny. So we'll just go ahead and uh, jump right into it. All right, let's get started. God's sovereignty, human depravity, and imputed righteousness. These are the three things that he's going to use as arguments. I think it's important to address each one of these and uh, to go down through there and use the points to break them down and make sure we understand them correctly. Just, just right here at the beginning, um, and uh, I wasn't, I wasn't too put off by this, um, but it's, it's, it's a point usually in debate where. Uh, your opening statement, whether you're going first or second, is not to interact with your opponent yet. Uh, typically, what you'll do is you'll interact with the uh, affirmation that's being debated. So in this case, it would be that Matt would simply be looking at the affirmation of sola fide, and he would interact with that and give reasons why he disagrees with that specific statement. And then in his second uh, statement, his first rebuttal, uh, he would begin to interact with what I had begun to say. Uh, and then in my first rebuttal, I would begin to interact with what he was going to say. 
and uh, really, uh, you know, I wasn't too put off by this. You know, it's it was our it was both of our first debate, and so you know, there's there's going to be some, uh, you know, uh, a little bit in you know informal uh, or some some difficulties, you know, with with that. And I, I wasn't offended by it or anything like that. Uh, but I, I will point out that it actually helps uh, in debate. As far as I, I can tell, and as far as I've studied on it, if you give a strong opening statement of your own view, because then you have something to sort of springboard off of for the rest of the debate. You'll notice that throughout the debate, I kept referencing back to my opening statement and the arguments that I used in my opening statement. And it's good to have that, that foundation of your opening statement that you can jump off of and... Uh, begin to to uh, dismantle your opponent's position from is from your opening statement you clarify what you believe first so that you can then uh, clarify why you disagree with your opponent and so you know it, it's a small point but uh, i thought i'd bring it up anyway first we need to understand that faith is not just granted to you tanner you know this because you yourself have had to study in order to have faith you've had to study the word You've had to take your free will and use it in studying that word. That did not, it was not just gifted to you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're going to have to face that. That people aren't just miraculously gifted today in this century with faith. It doesn't just happen. People have to study and come to the knowledge of what's going on. With the first point, you went with God's sovereignty. Okay, um, so there's his first, you know, little statement. Uh, re trying to rebut what I was saying uh, about God's sovereignty and about how uh, someone comes to faith in uh, Christ. Uh, his first citation there, he didn't give the reference, but it's it's uh, Romans 10, uh, 17 here. Uh, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what he was essentially trying to say is that uh, the way that you come to faith, that the 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 only way that you come by faith, right? Or, or, or the, the only, that, that the only necessary and sufficient conditions for coming to faith is by reading the word of God or, or having it read to you or, or hearing it or, or whatever. Um, and, and, and so he's, he's essentially saying that, uh, you know, hey, you, you've had to study, you've had to, to read the scripture in order to, to know what God has promised. And, and so you, uh, you've come to faith in Christ. Uh, well, yeah, um, w of course, uh, hearing the gospel, the hearing the proclamation of the gospel, the, the, the uh, necessary means that God has ordained for uh, bringing people to Christ uh, is necessary. It's necessary to hear of Christ uh, in order to believe on Christ. You know, that's, that's pretty obvious. But here's the question. Is reading the scripture or hearing the scripture, having it read to you, is that sufficient for someone to have faith? Does that automatically give somebody faith? Or does the activity of God have to be involved uh, in this? And uh, I think that, that in our in our discussion, it was brought out fairly clearly that you do have to have the activity of God to give faith. Uh, we looked at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, uh, that, that God gives the faith, that, that, that it's by his grace that, that faith comes and and so uh you know we had we saw that there if you looked later in romans about how god had dealt to every man the measure of faith in chapter 12 uh and even in the context of chapter 10 here that he references uh the very next verse says but i say have they not heard yes verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world this is talking about israel as not israel heard, you know, uh, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. Israel heard, they knew, 
and God says by Moses that he will provoke them to jealousy by the Gentiles, by a foolish nation. Uh, he, will, he will provoke them. In verse 20, But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Here we have that the Gentiles were not seeking. They were not looking for God. And yet he was made manifest to them. He was found of them, even though they weren't looking. God revealed himself to them in the gospel by, uh, the, by his power to the point that he would anger Israel, right? Uh, here we don't just see the scripture. We don't just see the word of God being read, the gospel being proclaimed, but we see also the activity of God working in the Gentiles. And the difference that's made between the Gentiles and the Jews in this context is that the Gentiles did not all, they did not have the, the, the grand tradition of Torah, the scripture, right? They did not have that. And yet God saved them. Israel had that great tradition, right? And yet they did not believe. And, and so here we see that, that it's not who can read the scripture more. It's not who has read the scripture more. It's not working up faith in ourselves to, toward the scripture, but it's the activity of God. That, that he does this. In verse 21, But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. That is, he's, he's stretched out his hands. They had the scripture. They had his revelation to them. And yet, they were, they were a disobedient and gainsaying people. They did not believe. And so, uh, th that first citation, I think, was, was misused. Uh, here. You use uh, Romans 8.28, Romans 8.33, and through this section it talks about being called. That these people are justified when they're called. Well, how does God call, Tanner? If you look at John 6.44, it'll tell you how God's called. Look at John 6.44 and 6.45. Jesus says, uh, no one can come to me unless the Father who, who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. So nobody can come to the Father unless they're sent. How does that happen? Verse 45, he says, uh, and it is written in the prophets, and they all shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned. When we hear and, and learn from the scriptures, we're able to come to God. That's how we know about him. Otherwise, we just know he exists. We don't. We cannot know Christ outside of the scriptures. So we are called into his justification through the scriptures. Second Thessalonians. All right. Um, so again, he he makes this uh, this argument he's beginning to make, um, where he he's trying to to uh, counter the citation of uh, Romans eight twenty eight uh, in order to. Uh, to, to try and uh, and say that 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 the calling here is just that they had read the scripture is what he's trying to do essentially that because they had read the scripture because they had studied it because they had they had been diligent about it and uh, they they had, they had learned these things that therefore they uh, they believed and that's that's uh, that's it um, and he's trying to say that the calling or drawing of the Father is not so much an active thing that God does, is what it seems to me that he's saying, but it's it's sort of a, a passive thing that God he gives the scripture and then the people read the scripture and they believe it and they they come to Jesus Christ. That's not that's not what John six forty four says though. It says, No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up the last day. Uh, I believe in, in that last statement. He said that they were sent, right? Whoever was sent uh, 
from the Father. And that's not what this the, the passage says, that they were sent from the Father. It says that they were drawn. This is the same uh, drawing that's used, of, uh, as many have said, many commentators have said, uh, uh, and noted that this is the, uh, the, the same kind of drawing that you do to a net when you're pulling it up onto the shore when you're fishing. And, uh, and so it, it's not ascending. It's not something that God sort of passively, uh, you know, does, but it's something he actively does. He draws. He, he goes out and he, he gets and he draws to Jesus Christ. He brings to Jesus Christ. Uh, in verse 45, he, he notes, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and learned from the Father cometh unto me. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and um, that was my cell phone. Um, and uh, the uh, this passage here um, about uh, having uh, heard and learned from the Father, uh, having been taught of God, um, he, he just takes this to mean that they've read the scripture, that they have studied the scripture, that, they, that, that, that because they have read the scripture, therefore they are drawn to the Son. And uh, again, that, that's just not shown, it's not borne out in uh, the context here. Um, it doesn't say whoever has read the scripture that they shall all read the scripture of God. Uh, it says that they shall all be taught of God. God teaches them. Every man that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh to me. Where in here does it, does it even reference the scriptures other than the fact that this, this little citation, they shall all be taught of God, is written in the prophets? Where is the scripture uh, uh, even brought into this? Now, I think that, that it, it, it is in a sense in this, because it's, it, God works by the proclamation of the gospel. But is the proclamation of the gospel by itself, without the working of God, is that sufficient to bring anyone to Jesus Christ? Or does it say that God draws, that he draws, he brings actively to Jesus Christ? And I think that that's, that's what the text is, is, is plainly saying that God actively draws to the Son. Now, I think he was going to, I'm going to back up a little bit. He was going to Why, the we just know we exist. We don't, we cannot know Christ outside of the scriptures. So we're called into his justification through the scriptures. Second Thessalonians 2.14 says the same thing. God calls by the gospel. I don't have this in my notes. I must have uh, missed it in this, but Second Thessalonians 2.14, I believe it was. Uh, uh, let's back to 13. Uh, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So in the, in the context, the verse before, uh, God is the one who's chosen. God is the one who, who from the beginning has chosen to salvation through sanctification and belief of the truth. He has, he has chosen to believe the truth. And that's, that, this is the context that, that we're in here. That's what comes first. And then in verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this, this does not uh, say anything against the sovereignty of God here. God is the one who uh, has chosen these. Uh, he's the one who has called them by the gospel. Uh, and he's the one who's ordained them to belief. He, he has chosen them to believe actively. Um, uh, I don't know. I know that he, he, he didn't go here. I, I don't think that there was anything malicious about it. I think that he, he wanted to get as much in as he could. And I, I completely understand that, and that's fine. But when we, when we use a passage, we at least need to be conscious of, of what the passage says in its context, what's around that passage. And it's, it's difficult for me to think that he's, he's really latched on to, to the whole of, of the argument that's around this passage here. 
So that should break down the first so the sovereignty action. God is sovereign. He does things. He moves nations. He, I mean, he uses nations. He used Babylon against Israel in the Old Testament times. He's used, uh, he's used different people to do different things. That does not affect their salvation. And when you go to Romans 9 and 15, you're, you're talking about God moving Israel and doing things through nations there. There's nothing about salvation in those callings, in that elect, in that section of Scripture. Okay, so we need to withdraw from that. We need to get rid of that, Tanner. We need to get rid of Romans 9 uh, because uh, apparently, uh, apparently it's not a good argument for... Uh, the sovereignty of God, he says. Uh, specifically, of course, I read Romans nine fifteen. Uh, he saith to Moses, "I will have mercy on whom I will have, <coughs> whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion." So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Even if he sort of takes this to be a, a a corporate thing that this is this is moving in nations does God not work toward nations in much the same way he works towards individuals that God has mercy and and compassion as he wills and it, it says in verse 16 so then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth but of God that showeth mercy that's extremely pertinent to our debate that God uh, does not regard th that they will their will that they have that they have um, or he, he is not um, uh, electing here according to to the will of men uh, he, he's not he's not uh, making reference to that in his uh, choice even if you say of nations right he's he's not making reference to that uh, he is not making reference to their effort that they've run, but he shows mercy as he wills. It's not according to, to their effort, um, even on a national level. I think that that, that that doesn't harm the argument, even if you take it on a national level. Of course, I'm not going to take it on a national level. Uh, Matt just stated that this is a national uh, this is a national text, and he didn't give any argument for why that is. Uh, I'm going to give a few point, a few uh, observations here about the text, why it's, uh, why I do not believe that it's solely uh, a national discourse. Uh, but uh, you know, Matt didn't give anything, uh, and so you know, uh, I would have liked to have uh, to have had that. Uh, the text continues on in verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, I have raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my, my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Wherefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Uh, Pharaoh, an individual, Granted, a federal head of the people, but still an individual. He says that he has raised him up for this purpose, that he might show his power in him, so that he uh, hardeneth who he wills. Uh, now, I, I, I take a, um, a view of, of hardening, uh, that God simply uh, leaves him to his own free rebellion, uh, that, that uh, of course, he freely rebels. Uh, but here in the text we have, uh, with reference to an individual, he hath mercy on whom he will, and whom he will he hardeneth. Both sides here. God uh, has mercy, and he uh, hardeneth. And so uh, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't see how just throwing out there that this is about nations, this is not about individuals, does, uh, does anything to prove that the text is, is actually exclusively about nations. I think that there's a, there's a national thread that goes through this, but there's also a personal one that goes through this chapter also. And uh, he needs to, to, to show, that he needed to have shown that this is exclusively a national uh, election that's going on here. Uh -huh.
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not miraculously gifted. If it were, you wouldn't have to study. The second point is human depravity. This and, and these points, they're coming from Calvinism is where this is coming from. It's coming from the five points of Calvinism. So as I have studied and seen, you can break down these points. It's a man-made doctrine that we need to disregard. Human depravity is a total lie. Look at Jesus' words in, in Matthew 9, 14. All right. Um, just a uh, short little note here. He, he brought up Calvinism. He brought up that these are, he, he said that these are the, uh, the five points of uh, Calvinism. Um, of course, I never brought up Calvin in the debate at all. I never referenced him. I never used Calvin as any kind of an authority. I was simply going to the scripture. And uh, I, I think it's a little, it's a, it's, it's a little funny. Um, maybe not so funny, but, uh, I've told Matt this before that I'm not a, I'm not a, a full out Calvinist. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't claim Calvin. Uh, I don't claim to, uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, uh follow him everywhere. I, I don't even claim to be a compatibilist with regard to free will. Um, what I would be more, you know, accurately described as is, 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 you know, sort of, uh, sitting the fence between, uh, Almoraldism and, uh, um, uh, Molinism, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, straddling the fence there between the two. Uh, I, I, I see good points on, uh, both sides of the fence. I'm not a, I'm not an all out Calvinist and most Calvinists would not, would not, uh, uh, accept uh, my theology as being Calvinist, and so uh, you know I, I don't I don't see why he's he's you know bringing this up. I never mentioned Tulip. I never mentioned Calvin. I never mentioned the Reformed tradition, uh, and, and so uh, it, it just doesn't it it's not it, it, that's not me. Uh, it's it's just a, a stray point that he brought up, and that he never really. Um, you know, now there's a lot of good uh, theology uh, that that comes out of the Reformed tradition. In fact, I would take uh, most theology that comes out of the Reformed tradition. Those two or three spots where I would have a little bit of rub with most Calvinists, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're small points, uh, but I think significantly small points. Um, and, and so, uh, I, I I wish that he would have uh, he would have. Uh, not brought that up because I didn't bring it up. Let the little ones come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. He's telling totally innocent children that they are not depraved and their style, their type of people is going to be in heaven. Uh, he brings up uh, Jesus' teaching on uh, children. And uh, we know that Jesus' teaching on children, Jesus loved the children. Uh, and uh, he... He, he, he spoke very highly of their um, their capacity for trust, to trust in their uh, parents. Um, but he doesn't say here that the children are not born of bond parents. This, this passage just does not, uh, it, it does not destroy the, the doctrine of total depravity. Um, yeah, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Okay, does that say anything against total depravity? The fact that we're enslaved to sin, as I kept bringing back up in the debate. No, it doesn't. Uh, don't forbid them to come unto me. How does that, that, how does that uh, say that they're uh, not enslaved to sin or that they don't have uh, a slavery to sin on them? Uh, the th in the last part for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, uh, I believe that children who die young, who die before a, a certain age where they are, uh, accountable, where they are, are, are able, uh, to be uh, judged as moral agents. Uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, that they will be, uh, of the kingdom of heaven, but that doesn't say anything against depravity either. Uh, depravity does not say that we are guilty of the sins of our fathers. It doesn't say that I inherit the guilt of, uh, of my fathers. 
But what it does say is that I'm enslaved to sin. Um, this, this is all that's necessary for, for my argument, is that we are slaves to sin, that we cannot stop sinning by ourselves, that we cannot do that which is pleasing to God by ourselves. Depravity says, essentially, God has to work first. If anything is going to happen, it has to happen by God's will, by his activity. And this passage just doesn't, just doesn't say anything about that. Ezekiel, and, and the Calvinistic point is that Adam's sin... Now, he mentioned Ezekiel there just uh, for a, a moment, and, and he didn't go to it, but I'll, pay, I'll pick it up anyway. It's essentially that the, the, uh, the uh, son shall not die for the sins of his father, and the father shall not die for the sins of his son, is essentially what the passage says. Um, again, that's, that's, uh, that's all right. Uh, that, doesn't, that does not uh, negate the doctrine of total depravity. Because again, depravity is not, it's not about, the doctrine of depravity itself is not about the transmission of guilt of sin from father to son. It's about the transmission of the bondage of sin from father to son. And, and really from our federal head, Adam, to his children to all his children because he represented all of us when he was sold into slavery he sold himself into the slavery of sin we also were sold with him in his slavery to sin and so talking about the guilt of sin does not uh, it does not uh, do anything to, to put down the doctrine of total depravity by one man uh, sin entered the world and by one man uh, let, let me look this up let me look this verse up Ezekiel 18, 20 will tell you that um, you don't inherit your parents' sin. We don't inherit our parents' sin. Our sin and our, our unrighteousness, our deeds that we've done and messed up in front of God is only ours. Our parents are not responsible for our mess-ups. We're not responsible for their mess-ups. Again, I, I just wish that he had gone to the passage and, and you know, seen what it said. But again, the passage does not, uh, it does not negate that we are slaves to sin because of what our first father did. In Romans 5.12 it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and this is the verse he's going to use to say we're totally depraved, or one of them, uh, and death through sin, and thus spread to all men because all sin. That's Romans 5.12. So through one man sin entered the world. Um, but it also says uh, in, in verse 15, For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. The one man sinned entered the world and, and affected all. So if he takes that to mean that you're all totally depraved, then by Christ's death you're all totally righteous. You're all totally saved. If, all, if the condemnation of Adam marks everybody is in sin when they're born then all are in, are made righteous when they're born so it's by free will it's by choice all right um so he goes to uh, romans 5 uh, a, a passage that i actually didn't bring up in the debate it's a good passage for uh, our enslavement and, uh, to sin that we are depraved that because of adam's sin we all do sin and are guilty of sin because we're enslaved to it. It's it's a good passage for that, um, but he he really abuses the passage here, and I really want to uh, push on this a little bit. Uh, verse twelve: Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Uh, again, uh, th this is a good good statement, right? Because of Adam's sin. Because of, because of him, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Uh, because all have sinned, death is on them. Because Adam sinned, therefore all men sin, and therefore death is propagated to all of us. Death and guilt as a concept, not the guilt of Adam's original sin. I, I don't I don't really you know take that line. Um, but nonetheless, we are all guilty of sin 
because we've all been enslaved to sin in Adam. That's what this passage is getting at. And he he tries to to sort of sidestep this. He doesn't actually deal with the passage, um, but he so- tries to sidestep it by saying, well, it can't be taken like that because it would lead to some absurd uh, conclusion. Uh, and he goes to verse 15, though usually when people take this line, they go to verse 17. If by one man's offense, death won't reigned by one, uh, much more they which receive abundance of... Or, that's no, no, um, uh, verse 18, I'm sorry. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto uh, justification of life. And what he's trying to say here is that, well, if all men are made sinners because of the act- activity of Adam, right, Well, then it must be that because of the activity of Christ, therefore all men receive justification of life. And so he's trying to say, well, this would lead to universalism. If if you're taking this to mean a universal sinfulness of man, a universal depravity, then uh, it it also would mean that Christ... um, that that Christ's grace is 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 shed on all all will be saved, um, but that's not that's again not the case. Uh, the passage is in a federal context. Uh, the passage is is telling us that if we are in Adam, that is, if he is our federal head, then we have that that sin. Uh, that bondage to sin transmitted to us and we sin therefore and thus we are all uh condemned in sin but then if we are in christ then for all of us who are in christ all of us who are in christ he reigns to justification of life his righteousness uh, is the free gift upon all men unto the justification of life for all those who are in him uh, in him uh, and uh, uh, and so this this passage is in a federal uh, context um, in verse 15 uh, 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 anyway, uh, it's a federal context, so we'll just we'll just leave it at that. We need to get moving. Um, he says we cannot seek God because we are totally depraved. That's just not true. I know because I went after God. There's many people watching that know that hey, you know, if I study the Bible, I can learn about God, and by faith, I can draw near to Him. I can know who He is and what His plan is for me. Uh, he just gives an anecdote here, and he. He treats it like an argument, and it's not an argument. Uh, he he doesn't get this from the scripture. He's he's getting this from uh, a uh, personal experience that he's had, and personal experience is oftentimes not very good uh, for doing theology with. And so, um, Romans six and verse seventeen says. Uh, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. From the heart, you obeyed that doctrine. You took a choice to obey the doctrine, to obey the teaching. And that's what we see. We see that um, God chose Israel. Right? He chose them to bring them across and, and to bring forth the Savior. But even some of them rejected God. If he had chosen them and they had the choice to reject him, it shows a free will. Uh, going to Romans 6, uh, he, you know, verse 17, God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men, because of the limitation of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, uh, and to iniquity unto iniquity even so now yield your members servants of righteousness unto holiness uh he he's going here and he's trying to to say that this is free will 
that this is essentially that they were able in themselves to reach up and to to obey from the heart by themselves and to attain to righteousness um that's not again that's not again uh, what the passage is saying at all um first off it, it, verse 17 itself begins by saying god be thanked he thanks god for them and this is something that i've often i've often found very useful in uh my own bible study right is if god is thanked for something that means he's responsible for it right it's 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 not that that god is thanked and somebody else is really the one responsible for this but here god is responsible he's the one who did this god be thanked that ye were the servants of sin but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you god be thanked for it and so whatever is being talked about here is the work of god that god is has done this because god is thanked for it but also i don't think that this is even in the context of justification uh justification uh was in the previous chapters justification the the, the discussion of just justification came to its head in chapter four uh where where uh it talks about Abraham and and how he was justified. And verse uh, five says, "Being then justified, right? That this is this is something that's happened. This is something that he's already talked about. This is how uh, you know we, we've been justified. Is what what he was talking about before in chapter four. And now that he's come to chapter six, he's talking about something else. He's talking about yielding ourselves not any longer as servants to sin." as we once were one time we were servants to sin now he's saying yield yourselves servants to god yield yourselves servants to righteousness and verse 19 ends uh even so now yield your members servants of righteousness unto holiness that is unto being set apart and this is the doctrine of sanctification this is, this is how we are made more like Christ. This is not how we're reckoned righteous before God, because that was already established to be by faith alone in chapter 4. And if you bring that here into chapter 6, then you're, you're, you're not following the flow of the argument. You're just jumping forward to chapter 6 to grab what you want and run with it. And so this is... Uh, this is another abuse of uh, the, the passage here that we see. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll move, go on ahead. All right. All right, imputed righteousness. This is the one that, uh, this is the one that Tanner's going to have some problems with. And Tanner, I want you to think about this. Use 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 to bring that home. Second Corinthians five twenty one. Um, maybe it's Second Corinthians first. In Christ, it's it's basically we're in Christ, we're made anew, we're a new creature uh, in Christ. Right. Well, Second Corinthians five. Let me find this man. It's in Christ, we're a new creature. I know it is. You guys have to excuse me. I'm a little bit nervous about this. So, it's a new creation in Christ. It's 517. <laughs> Some guys are out there like, man, it's 17. Go to 17, Matt. You're close. You're just way off. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the thing. In Christ is a very important aspect of this. If we're going to say that we're totally depraved and can't seek God, then we can't even know the way to get into Christ. But I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how you can get into Christ and have his righteousness imputed to you. 
Romans 5 and verse 8. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I must have missed some of what he said there. Um, he went to Second Corinthians five seventeen, right? And he's essentially saying that if, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. And and what he's going to try and do now is try to to tell us that baptism is the way that we get in Christ that it's it's sort of the the uh, the instrument of uniting us to Christ in in the sense of his federal headship right uh, and he's gonna go to a few few passages here and uh, we'll we'll see what he says I think I might have messed my uh, notes up here or something Actually, well, you're condemned in Christ, right? You're condemned outside of Christ, excuse me. People are condemned outside of Christ. And in Christ, they have redemption. In Christ is where his blood is. Uh, uh, Ephesians 1 and 7, Colossians 2 and 13. Um, is that good? There's another one. It's Colossians 1 14, Ephesians 1 7, and Ephesians 2 13. All right. Um, I'll just I'll just not quite. I won't. I won't really go to these passages. This is a a little peculiarity of uh, Church of Christ theology, and uh, I I I kind of like to to you know just in my own mind, my own goofy mind. Uh, I, I like to call it the uh, "Are you washed in the blood?" kind of theology. Um, it takes the the idea that we are saved by Christ's blood, and it equates that with actually, as they'll use this language, actually coming in contact with his blood. Actually, actually, in some sense, um, it's it's hard to avoid with with the way that they speak about it. In, in some way, that the blood itself actually. Uh, touches us personally and, and it and it it washes us as to our nature and 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 we have to actually be there to touch it in a sense in a spiritual sense that they'll, they'll speak of it more in a spiritual sense they're not really talking physically but they're they're using this analogy of of touching it or being washed by it that like like you would be washed with water and there we have that sort of um, baptismal imagery there that that you know uh, they they they're trying to sort of conjoin with this idea that we're washed by Christ's blood, um, and this is not really this doesn't really gel to you know too well with the uh, the way that the scripture talks about sacrificial blood and how sacrificial blood was handled. Sacrificial blood was not used as a liquid to wash the people off to wash their bodies or, or anything like that that they they went and they washed in water they, they weren't washed with the blood but instead the analogy of washing was used for how the atonement worked that when the the the, the priest would take the blood and he would go into the mercy seat or he would take it and and he would offer the the blood to god right it wasn't being shed out onto the people right but it was being presented to god nonetheless it was said to wash the people it was said to cleanse their sins and so it's it they they did not come into physical contact that all of the people didn't have to come by and come into physical contact with the blood instead what the scripture says when it when it talks of how christ has cleansed us Right and and how even he, he he by his death and by his his blood he has cleansed us from our sin, is not that he comes and he he takes a sponge full of his blood and he washes us, you know that's not what it's what it's it's getting at it's getting at that Christ shed his blood, and that that blood was the surety or the proof that he had given his life, 
and that blood was presented to God in a, in a, in a, this sort of metaphorical sense and this sort of spiritual sense. And, uh, so uh, this is just a, a strange point that I wanted to, to make, to, to, uh, put forward, uh, a, a sort of peculiarity of, uh, church of Christ or restorationist, uh, doctrine. And, uh, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really change much, but uh, I, I find it really interesting and, and, uh, very strange. In Christ is where his blood is. And there's a way to get there, to get to in Christ. You have to be baptized into Christ. All right, so Romans 6, it'll tell you this explicitly. In Christ is a new creation. I agree with you on that, Tanner. But anybody, even anybody watching this right now, can just choose that. They, that's in their own mind. They can just choose it. It's a free will decision. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that former doctrine to which you were delivered. That's in verse 17. Back it up a few verses. Back it up to Romans 6 and verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ? Uh, verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him that through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also... Uh, we should walk in newness of life. We can be baptized into Christ. That's All right. Uh, Romans 6. He he brings up Romans 6, 17 again, and I, I dealt with that just a minute ago. That's about, this, this whole context is about sanctification, and it's about yielding ourselves as good servants of, uh, of, of Christ, of God in Christ. Um, He's, he, he comes to this, and this is a favorite of, of, of uh, restorationists and uh, those who believe in baptismal regeneration. Uh, that if, you know, in verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should we also should walk in newness of life. There's a few things that can be uh, noted about this, uh, this passage here. First is that chapter 6 is full of analogies and images uh, which represent a, a reality that, 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 that we, we have. Um, but that we don't literally necessarily go through. Um, and baptism, as far as it hearkening to death, uh, does not necessarily have to be the substance of our being reckoned dead with Christ. It can be an image that's to be, to be shown forth. Uh, some of these images would be uh, that we, of course, are uh, dead, in verse six, we are crucified with him. When we're baptized, we're not uh, actually, uh, you know, hung up on a cross. Uh, we are destroyed. The, the body of sin uh, is destroyed. Uh, our bodies are not destroyed. They don't dissolve away in the baptismal water. And uh, and so these these images, these. Uh, uh, you know that 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 are being talked about sort of give us a hint to the context that this is this is using figurative language here uh, that that baptism as an image is a figure of death it's a figure of crucifixion it's a figure of the destruction of the body of sin and so it's it's figurative here but another thing is that that many commentators um I believe D.A. Carson uh, has has commented on this on this passage in this way. Uh, have noted that this is not necess This is not uh, really telling us. It's not a discourse about how you get into Christ, but rather it is a a discourse about what baptism means in light of. Uh, the, the question about whether or not we should continue in sin and what it represents is a transfer of uh, external uh, f federal uh, representation in the world from uh, Adam, from the man of sin uh, to Christ. Uh, 
And that because we've undergone this, this symbol, this, this ceremony of the transfer of authority from uh, Adam to Christ, therefore in our lives, we should live consistently with that. Because we've undergone the ceremony, we should, we should live consistently with that. We should become good servants of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, it fits the context. This is about sanctification. This is about living holy lives. This is not about how we get into Christ. It is using the image of baptism, the image of how we have been buried with Christ, to tell us something about how we should live. And uh, that's what the text itself is, is saying. It's saying that, and it's screaming it, I think, through the use of so many uh, images, so many similes, uh, or not similes, but by using, um, uh, using likenesses of death, of destruction, of crucifixion. And uh, it, the, the conclusion is that we henceforth should not serve sin. And uh, so, you know, there we go. There's Romans 6. That's where his righteousness is imputed to us. Um, I, I want to bring up a few things after addressing those arguments. Faith itself is a work. Can you pull up Let's see. Thank you, sir. I'm looking through my memes, looking through a few memes here. I, I can't resist. Uh, I think it's, uh, I. You know, again, I don't mean anything against Matt. Uh, he's my cousin. I, I love him. And uh, I don't mean him any harm by this. But uh, I, I thought it was I thought it was kind of funny to um, to to make slides and call them memes in in a debate. And I think it's just probably a, a, a uh, an indicator of how our culture kind of thinks and, and stuff like that. And I think it's funny. Uh, I know that Matt thought it was funny too. He mentions it later. He says uh, he he mentions that one of them was funny and that uh, you know it's it's all in good fun. Uh, I I do wish that um, that uh, I I do wish that it that uh, he had he had called them something else because I I couldn't help but uh, just about explode laughing when uh, when I heard him say that live. Let's start somewhere else. Let's start here. There's different types of works described in the Bible. If you will put up uh, 2A for me. There's different types of work described in the Bible. And I want to give Tanner credit to a, to a few of the works that are condemned. Because we don't need to accept all works as valuable to salvation. Works of obedience are valuable to our salvation. But as far as um, works of the old law or works of merit... These are not valuable for salvation. Okay. Um, okay. So you'll see that uh, in, the, in the first little pericope I got there, you have works of the law. Those are condemned. You can't be saved by that. Um, it says, by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Galatians 2.16. If you look down a little further, it says, uh, now the, the works of the flesh are evident. These are a different kind of works, sinful works. Those are not beneficial. Condemn those works. They're not good for us. Um, Titus 3, 5, works of merit, doing works of our own, trying to be so good that God will save us. He's not going to save us because we're so good. It's not how salvation works. Okay, so there's some works that are condemned. There's some works that are essential to our salvation. It's not working out our own plan. You can get rid of the meme for me. It's not working out our own plan of salvation. It's not working the old works of the law, not the works of the flesh, the sinful works of the flesh. We're not saved by any of that. We're saved by works of obedience. If you go to 2B, okay, so in, two, in this meme here, 2B, essential works that are essential to your salvation Tanner are a work of repentance. Repentance is a work. You have to bear fruit worthy of repentance as John the Baptist said in Matthew 3. Those Jews were required to work, have fruit worthy of repentance. Uh, John 6 29 then Jesus answered and said to them 
this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. All right. Um, here's another uh, uh, argument that he's making. I let it run for a little bit because to, well, to get the sort of most of the argument in here, uh, the whole argument essentially is on the screen now. Um, he had the, the slide before, which, which, you know, condemned work, works of righteousness, works of the flesh and stuff like that. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't really pertain anything, uh, to the debate because I would say that, yeah, those don't, those don't say, um, especially works of the, the flesh or the works of sin, you know, that, that, uh, you know, I, I would think that that'd go without saying that, uh, that we would both agree that those don't save. Um, but here in his, in his slide that he's got up, uh, he's trying to say that this, uh, this, these passages he has, up uh, uh, tells us that there are some works, which, which you must do in order to, uh, be saved. And, uh, it's not, it's not here. Um, he, in, in Acts 26, 20, I'll just go off of the slides that he has up on the screen. Um, that it talks about works befitting repentance or works worthy of repentance, works which, uh, which go with repentance. Uh, he is trying to say that this passage is, is, is declaring that repentance is a work and that, and anybody who can read just said, just understands that's not the case, uh, that these works fit repentance, but they are not repentance. They're not the same thing as, uh, what this is, is saying even is that you may have repentance without works that befit them, right? Uh, that, that you're, you, you may not, uh, be, be doing works, which are, which are, which are fitting to it. Um, you know, in, in one sense, at least in a grammatical sense here that we're, we're getting at, um, these these works are not the same thing as the repentance and uh, this is a, a problem which I've ran in, uh, into before uh, when uh, uh, I believe it's it's uh, Colossians uh, that it talks about uh, your uh, works your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope I believe is what it is it's in chapter one I think of, of Colossians um, and he, he's gone to that before privately with me. And he's, he's tried to say that, see, well, faith is a work. But just as here and in there, uh, it's not. Uh, the the, the uh, work flows out of faith. The labor flows out of love. The patience is a result of hope. They're not the same thing, but they are correlated. They're necessarily correlated. And I would say that the works befitting repentance are the works are not the same thing as the repentance, but they're necessarily correlated. The, 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 the works flow out of the repentance, but they're not the repentance itself. The, the repentance is a spiritual state of being. It is not a labor that, that we do. Uh, John 6, 29, uh, I, I mentioned this, you know, later in the debate, the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Uh, I believe uh, that this is uh, God's activity, that God is the one working here. Um, it, it's, it's not a work that you must do, that, that, that believing on him who he sent is a work that we do and is counted to us as a work, but instead it's that God works. God does this and we, we you know, so that we believe. And so uh, I'll just is a work. leave it at that. And I can show that. I have some more memes here. Let's go with, uh, let's go with 8B. Okay. If you look here at 8b, Jesus is going to tell you that there is a work you have to do to inherit eternal life, Tanner. It's free will. God did not just gift you with the knowledge you've had. You've had to study that. Um, though, granted, I think some parts of it are wrong. But I do know that you had to study and pull some fruit from the gospel in order to uh, have this knowledge. It wasn't just gifted to you automatically. Uh, again, I'll just point everyone back to the beginning of this uh, this little review that we've got going here. 
that um, it, it's not that God saves me because I studied so much, because I, uh, I, I listened well in Sunday school or whatever. That's not, that's not why I was saved. That's not how I got faith. Uh, the, the way that I got faith was that God gave it to me. God worked in me. Um, and so, uh, there's, there's a, a little difference there. Um, uh, not a little difference. That's a pretty big difference. Um, but he's going to, he's going to read this and I'll let him read this and, and we'll comment on it. And 8B, you'll see here that do, Jesus says to the, the, the Jews have been following him. He just fed 5,000 people and the Jews follow him and, um, they're wanting to get loaves of bread. They're chasing him down for bread. And Jesus says, do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. So Jesus is saying, do not labor for the food that perishes, but, but what, Jesus? He's saying, labor for the food that endures to eternal life. If you'll go to 8C. All right, we'll, we'll comment on that uh, quickly. Um, this, this passage, uh, I, it does not, um, it does not, uh, overthrow uh the idea that we're justified by faith alone um the first part of the statement they were laboring they were following christ they were walking after him trying to get food from him right uh they were they were trying to get physical food and uh you know he's rebuking them for this but he says don't don't labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life, right? The food which is, uh, which which will give life, or not give life, but the, the food is unto eternal life. It endures forever. Um, uh, is 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 what he's saying here in the passage. He he's he's giving us a statement of value here. In other words, that the the food, the bread, is not worth labor. It's not worth it in comparison to that which endures to everlasting life. He's not telling them, he's not telling them that they're necessarily able to attain to that food, right? By their own efforts, by their own doing of something. But rather he is, he's telling them that uh, as a statement of value, it's worth more. If you're going to labor, then your labor should be toward this. It, 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 it's worth, it's, it's, it's worth far more than uh, some bread and some fish, uh, labor for, uh, the food, which endures to everlasting life. But the second part of the verse really tips Jesus hand. And he does this intentionally. Uh, he says, which the son of man will give you. It's a gift that he gives. The son of man will give it to you. And this same kind of language is found all throughout uh, the Gospel of John. If you look in uh, John uh, chapter 4, in fact, uh, 4 verse 10, Jesus is talking to the, uh, we'll look in verse 7, uh, he's talking to the woman of Samaria. Uh, he, it says, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that, that saith to thee, Give me to drink, and here it is, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water, given a gift. Uh, the, he says, you would have asked, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. Uh, this is not a labor, which she does. This is not something that she, uh, has to, uh, attain to by reading the scripture or, or studying it or, or, by um, doing works of obedience, but is, he simply says you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. This is a theme in the book of John that it's given. It's a gift. 
from God. Uh, that 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 this is that this is um, done. And uh, if you go back into the debate, I won't I won't uh, rehash it here. But if you go back into the debate, you just read it. You'll see that we got into Romans six uh, even more, even earlier in this review. We looked at verse forty four. We looked at uh, uh, other passages uh, here, and uh, uh, we saw that. That John 6 is just about how God gives it as a gift. It's not something that we have to attain to. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll continue on, and uh, I think we're just about done. Uh, I'll do the rest of it on another day. For the food that perishes, but, but what, Jesus? He's saying labor for the food that endures to eternal life. If you'll go to 8C... So, um, because of... So he tells them, uh, you need to labor for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has sent his, set his seal on him. You need to labor for this eternal life, the food to eternal life, which is faith. Um, the Jews then ask him, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work those works, work the works of God? What do we do? What can we do? I know you don't like that word, do, but it's in there. The problem is that these are the Jews asking Jesus who are not asking him uh, out of out of a, a genuine faith out of a genuine uh, desire for him uh, they are uh, they're asking him out of their own sinfulness out of their own sinful heart they said to him what shall we do that we may work the works of God what shall we do that we can uh, we can get this for ourselves that that we can uh, do these works, and God God has to give us this. Uh, just as they thought that if they followed Christ long enough, he would have to give them more food because they would end up in the wilderness again or whatever. Uh, that's not that's not uh, that's not what the passage is. That, that that's not where we get our theology from. Is from the Jews who didn't even understand what they had. When Jesus came, uh, they didn't see him for who he was. They didn't desire him for who he was, and uh, and so there we go. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I I am upset with their question because it was a wrong question. It it, it was not asked out of genuineness. At the end of this this chapter, essentially everybody left him. So, yeah. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. That's, um, that's part of it. Like, we, we need to believe. And I know you agree that we need to and believe. And it is the work of God um, that we the, believe. The thing that I want to I address here is that um, the teaching of total depravity. I'm totally depraved. I don't know why you're even speaking if I'm so totally depraved that I can't even understand that. If I can't seek God of my own will, I don't even understand why you entered the debate. That doesn't make sense. We need to let go of that doctrine. It's not true. And you know this. We've had this discussion. Uh, back in December when we sat down and had that study, I know that you agreed to the fact that babies aren't going to hell. You agreed to that. We agreed to several things, and, and I appreciate that about you. I don't know... Um, from our study, I'm not sure why you went back into those things. It doesn't make much sense. But now you went to Abraham. All right. Essentially, he was saying that if, if, if man is totally depraved, then the debate is meaningless. Well, um, Matt may think so. Uh, Matt may not think that it's enough that God has told us to uh, defend the faith, to, to earnestly contend for the faith. Uh, he may not think that, that it's enough that God has simply said uh, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He may not uh, believe that it's enough uh, that the, the Great Commission uh, is, is, is sent out, that, that we, he, we have been told to, to, to preach the gospel. Uh, he may not think that that's, that's a sufficient reason, the fact that God has asked us to do it. Um, for me, it, it would be a sufficient reason. Uh, to, to do that. If God had simply asked it, we would be obligated to do it, whether we thought it was rational, uh, a rational course of action or not. 
uh, nonetheless, they're they're uh, from the 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 perspective of total depravity, there is a good reason for going out and preaching the gospel or for going and participating in debate. That's because God does use means. God does uh, send out his word by the mouth of uh, preachers. And by his activity conjoined with that proclamation, it does bear fruit. It does go out and uh, does what he has told it to do. Uh, I can go out in faith knowing that at the proclamation of the gospel, the Spirit of God does work according to his will. That the wind does blow, even if it blows where it listeth and you can't uh, determine the sound, you can't hear the sound of it, uh, or you, you, you can only hear the sound of it, and you, but you can't tell when it, or where it comes from, where it goes. Uh, nonetheless, the Spirit does work. And I can go out and I can preach the gospel knowing that the Spirit works. And that's enough for me. Uh, so I also can come to this debate and I can say, well, the spirit works through his word, even towards his own people. And that's, that's sufficient. So. Abraham, can you put up 9a? And Abraham believed God. <coughs> yes, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He didn't do it by works of the law as Romans 4, 3 was tell, uh, no, Romans 4, 3 is works of merit. <laughs> Excuse me. Romans 4, 3, you're not going to merit yourself into heaven. All right, so here, Abraham believed God. This comes from Genesis 5, 6. How did Abraham believe God? This is a obedient belief. Uh, God told Abraham that he would have an heir from his own body. Okay, so Abraham's going to have a child from his own body. He has to do something in order to make that happen. So when Abraham believed God, verse 6, and by having, uh, by having marital relations with Sarah and trusting that God would provide a son for him, if Abraham did not have marital relations with Sarah, then his belief would not have been counted righteous. He would, because through Sarah's, uh, through his own body, Christ would come. Um, and, and from this point, we know that he had to do something. When God told him, you're going to have fruit from your own body, it's going to bless nations, he had to do something. He had to use his body in order to fulfill that. Um, from this, I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, wait for... Some more arguments. All right, so there, there's his last argument of his uh, opening statement. And uh, again, uh, I, I address this pretty well in the debate, so I, I won't linger on it. Um, this argument does not, it does not, uh, it does not hold water because of two things. First off, the fact that Abraham had a son, or the fact that Abraham was, was given a son, was not the reason why he was justified. Uh, the, when, Isaac, when, when, when Abraham first held Isaac in his arms, that was not when it said it is said that God justified him. It said that God justified him back here, even while immediately after, in, in chapter 15, you, you read through the narrative, Abraham was questioning whether or not God would give him a son from his own body, from his own aging, dying body. He was concerned about that. And he asked God, well, could it be this Eliezer, right? And he said, no, I will give you a seed. I will give you a son from your own body. And in the middle of the narrative, the narrative continues on after verse 6. It says that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteous. It was counted to him as righteousness. And then the narrative continues on after that, right in the middle of the narrative, right there before Abraham had time to go home and to, as, as Mass says, have marital relations with Sarah right? He was justified. How was he justified? By faith. Immediately after this, Abraham goes out. He doesn't return to Sarah. He goes out and God shows him uh, uh, by, the, by the cutting of the covenant, by the, by the, the dividing of the, the bull in half, and by the, the Spirit of God walking in the midst of the bull. 
uh, or the the uh, the heifer. Uh, he 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 walks in the middle of it, uh, and uh, and he proclaims what he will do with Abraham. Uh, but by that time, Abraham was already justified. It was already said that, and only afterward did he go home. And then even when he went home, after that, it doesn't say that he went to Sarah. It says that Sarah gave him Hagar, and he had relations with Hagar, his concubine. And uh, so the bond child was born. And only after all of this does it say that, a that Sarah had a child long after Abraham was justified. And, and so it, the argument just doesn't hold water. It, it, it is a very misconceived argument. And uh, I just I just don't find it compelling at all. And, and so with that, uh, uh, this is the end of part one of my review of this debate. Uh, I'll come back and I'll do some more. I, I've taken more time today than I, I thought I would take on it. And uh, I'll just come back later and, uh, and I'll, I'll continue to review the debate. So with that, uh, God bless.